Hey Jill, how do you tell someone to slow down and listen to God before they make a life decision that may not be from God? Hello everyone and hello Joanne. How are you? I am so glad you asked this question. Joanne, this is a, a question that um, many might be struggling with. It might affect many. Um, let's face it, right? We all have been around people of God that often make decisions contrary. They make decisions contrary to God's word, contrary to God's will, and it's evident. It's evident to those that love them and care for them that their decisions is not God's will for them. They are essentially at a dead end, just like I am right now. They're at a dead end. So how do we help? Lots here. Lots and lots here. Let's get unraveled. First, I want to consider this. I'm going to consider right off the bat, safety. If they're in immediate danger, and especially if children are involved, if protection is needed, we're talking life and death stuff. You need to let the proper authorities know. You need to let your pastor know immediately, okay? I'm talking aside from that, let's continue to unravel, okay? Let's continue the unraveling motives. We have to look at our motives. Why do we need to intervene? Is God asking you to intervene? Are you just meddling? Being a busybody? I don't know. <laughs> Are you? Could it be that God is at work here and you are just simply unaware of it? For example, let's consider Job, okay? An honorable man. A man walking with God. A man that was obedient. Yet, yet God chose him and he allowed the enemy to attack him because he knew regardless, Job would be faithful. And he was. God always knows the heart. Job was faithful and obedient to God to the death. Job even said this, he cried out, though you slay me, I will trust you. Wow. Though you slay me, I will trust you. Yet his friends, even his wife, could not see that in Job. They gave him all kinds of ungodly advice, thinking that they were being godly. Thinking that Job had made some bad decision, thinking that Job was in sin. Okay? So, so could it be you are like Job's friends and don't really see what is going on? Perhaps you're more focused on others than you are on Jesus right now. Jesus said, Ooh, this is good. This is good. Listen, listen. This may be for you. Jesus says, Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard which you will be judged. So why worry about the speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own eye? <laughs> How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you, let me help you get rid of that little speck in your eye when you can't even see past the big log you have in your own eye? You hypocrite. These are the words of Jesus. Don't get mad at me. First, get rid of the log in your own eye. Then you will see well enough to deal with a speck in your friend's eye. Wow. So first, uh, what I'm trying to say here is that first we must address our own stuff. Are you in obedience? 
Are you walking in holiness? Do you have unaddressed sin in your life? First, check your motives. What are your motives in your desire to confront someone about stepping out of the will of God? Are you operating in love? Are you operating from the flesh, your own selfish desires? Check your heart before proceeding, okay? That is so important. Let's make sure that you don't have this huge log in your eye first, okay? Now, I wanna talk about the will of God. Let's unpack that, because there's a lot here. We need to have a clear understanding of what that is and what it is not. I have encountered many women who very sincerely, okay, very sincerely with tears running down their face, with tears in their eyes, they wanna know God's will. They want to know God's will for their life. They go through so much turmoil over this. And really, it's very simple. The will of God for your life is in the word of God. It's not difficult. It's not difficult to discover it unless, unless you don't read your Bible. That's the actual problem. Most women, most women attending church faithfully, even active in church, women who consider themselves women of God, I don't know why I did that, <laughs> women of God, they do not read their Bibles. Their Christianity is so superficial, just like the makeup, the makeup they put on for others on social media for Sunday, but that's it. They are truly not disciples of Jesus. They are not true followers of Jesus. How can I, how can I say that? Well, easy. Let me prove it to you. Disciples, they're constantly learning and moving and operating in God's will because they are following him closely. They're being guided by the Holy Spirit. They are moving when God says to move. Followers of Jesus are eating out of the word of God, daily feasting on scriptures. A disciple of Jesus would very rarely be crying to discover God's will. <laughs> because guess what? They are right in the thick of it, right smack in the middle of it. They are pursuing God with all of their heart, with all of their soul, with all of their mind. So when someone seems to be troubled because they don't know God's will, that alone speaks volumes. But I love the question anyhow, what is God's will for my life? I love when people ask that because it's really, it's quite simple. It's very simple to answer. God's will for you is that you glorify him. You were created to worship God. You were created to glorify him. We find that all over. But specifically Isaiah 43. In Isaiah 43, God reveals that he has made us for his glory. He has made us for himself to bring forth his praise. That's why Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 10, 31, do it all unto the, for the glory of God, unto the glory of God, for his name's sake. In Matthew and Mark, we find the Great Commission, Jesus' last command for us before he leaves planet Earth. Okay, so these words are important. Last words are always important. These words are important. Go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them, teaching them to observe all the things that I have taught you. Wow, all the things I've commanded you. He who believes, this is what Jesus says, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. 
And then he goes on to add this, the cherry on top, these are the signs that will follow those who believe, okay? So this is how you know, they will cast out demons. They won't be scared of demons, they will cast them out. They will speak with new tongues. They will pick up serpents and they wanna hurt them. They will drink anything deadly and it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and guess what? They will recover. I said that the will of God was easy to answer but it's not easy to receive. Most of you cringed or said, uh, that's not for me, that's for uh, ministers, that's for church leaders. Well, you would be wrong, you're wrong. That is for you. As a child of God and a believer of Jesus, you are a minister of God. In what capacity? How? that looks different for everyone for you it might be teaching a dance class selling makeup or jewelry you know running a marathon i don't know homeschooling homeschooling your children homeschooling your grandchildren becoming a baker working as a nurse uh god is limitless and he's so creative our gifts and talents and abilities, they hint toward the place we are going to light up here on earth. So, so his will is the same for all of us, okay? We glorify him, we worship him. In, in other words, we worship him through, through and in all that you do. And you go into all the world boldly, without fear, you make disciples, you cast out demons, you speak in new tongues, you raise the dead, you heal the sick, everywhere you go. However, the how is unique for each and every one of us. He will give you um, specific, his specific will for you. It actually becomes more clear, more and more clear as you continue to follow him, as you continue to go the narrow way and follow Jesus. The narrow way, you can enter God's kingdom only through a narrow gate. The highway to hell is broad, it's wide. Its gate is wide. For many will choose that way, but the gateway to life is very narrow. And the road, it's difficult. Only a few ever find it. Through this narrow way, you can't carry a lot of stuff. You're gonna have to let go of so many things that can't fit through that narrow way. But as you let go and you keep walking, you're finding true joy in God's perfect will for your life. There is no better place to be than in the will of God. That is the most perfect place to be. In God's will, there is safety, there is provision, there is blessing. Now, that doesn't mean there won't be hardship. That doesn't mean there won't be challenges or suffering. All the prophets, most of the prophets were locked up for years. They were misunderstood. They were ridiculed. Jesus was hated, he was tortured, he was crucified. Paul was in prison, shipwrecked. He had all kinds of illnesses, but they surrendered to God's will. That means that will take dying. In fact, if following Jesus had a theme, I say this so many times, if following Jesus had a theme, it would be dying. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I know, I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Jesus tells us that if, if you would come after him, and you deny yourself and take up the cross and follow him, follow him. He says, for whoever would save his life 
will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? What happens is that we often mistake the American dream for God's will for our life. We mistake our own selfish desires for God's will. Or we mistake people's goals for us as God's will. And through this, we become ambitious, money chasers, pleasure seekers, oh, self-indulgent, uh, comfort lovers, and people pleasers. God's word warns us about this. In Proverbs 14, 12, it states that there is a way that seems right to a man, but in the end, but in the end is death. Now, okay, now let's, let's get where we needed to be. <laughs> now for those walking this out, those walking with the Lord, those who love people and pray for them earnestly, those of you whose motives are truly pure, those of you who are discerning and, and you're not busy bodies, those of you operating in the spirit, for you watching a person living and making decisions contrary to God's word is like watching a train wreck and it's painful. So what are you to do? How do you tell someone to slow down and listen to God? before they make a life decision that may not be from God, which is the core, um, the core of this question is all about relationships. First and foremost, I wanna say, do not become an enabler and do not become Holy Spirit to them. I see women making these mistakes all the time. God may be trying to work in someone's life by putting them through the ringer, okay? That means they're going to make a series of bad decisions, okay? And, and they will have to deal with the consequences. But through that, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit is drawing them and he's pointing them to Jesus. Jesus is the only savior He's our savior. Remember that. Some of you forget and you want to be the savior to people. You will bend over backwards to accommodate them, to get them out of situations. You, you literally become their partner in sin without even knowing it. Hmm. You want to make life easy for them. You turn, you turn into their savior. And because of you, they won't turn to God. They won't surrender to Jesus. They won't cry out to be saved because all they have to do is cry out to you. So don't become an enabler, ladies. Please don't do that. Another mistake women make is that they want to be Holy Spirit for people. They want to be the sin police. You are not Holy Spirit. Only the Holy Spirit can truly convict someone of sin. Your nagging is not going to do it. You are not helping at all. Please stop it. <sighs> so when should you intervene or speak? even to speak words of wisdom and words of life, they must themselves ask you. Or you must have earned the right to speak into their life. Otherwise, your words will not be effective and you may be wasting your time. Theodore Roosevelt said, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. So it is very important 
to consider the relationship. I'm gonna ask you a question. Have, have you earned the right to speak into their life? Do they know you truly care? Do they know you are for them? Do they know you want the best for them? Do they see you as a person who walks with God and operates in wisdom? Do they value? Do they value your relationship? Do they see you as someone they can trust? Whew. If the answer to these questions are no, then you should not be going directly to them and pointing out their decision making, pointing out that their decisions are drawing them away from God's will. You still have a lot of work to do in that relationship. You, you obviously, you continue to pray for them, but stand back, hold your tongue, let God, let God do the work. And if the answer to these questions is, I don't know, I don't know if I've earned the right to speak into their life. Well, you may want to make yourself available. They themselves will let you know. They'll come to you and they'll ask you. Um, they'll reach out to you, okay? And they'll ask you for advice or, or seek guidance. In the meantime, continue to pray for them. And for those of you who right away, you answered, yes, absolutely. This person knows that I love them. This person knows that I care. They know that they can trust me. It's still a risk. Know that it can be a risk, but a risk worth taking if you truly love them. The risk is they may get angry. They may lash out at you, no longer speak to you. There's always a risk when confronting a friend about, about sin. That's a hard subject matter. <sighs> Moving away from God's will is a sin. So you're confronting them on that. Relationships, you've got to remember relationships are like bank accounts. In order to make withdrawals, to take risks in the relationship, to confront to address conflict, even when you cause injury in the relationship without meaning to, there must be enough deposited to recover from that, to cover it. Deposits are made over time, okay? That's when you show love, loyalty, support, encouragement. This goes for a husband and your child as well. You must make deposits in their lives before you can make withdrawals. Relational proximity, meaning that just because that's your husband or that's just because that's your son or your daughter, doesn't mean you get to make big withdrawals. You have to do the work. You have to make deposits before you can withdraw. You can't expect to nag your child, nag, 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 or your husband over and over, show little support, not be a person they can trust, you air out their laundry, then you expect them to, then you, you expect to withdraw. That's why some of you can't even speak into the lives of your husband or your children. You are overdrawn, completely in the red. Mm, you're in the red with them. Your words are no longer effective. So you must say nothing, nothing. You can't withdraw right now. Begin to make those deposits. Begin to build that relationship. Begin to build back that trust. Show them, show them support. Show them encouragement and quietly stand by them. You pray for them. You will know when you have enough deposits because they will come to you 
and they will begin to ask you for input. Until that moment comes, until that moment comes, remain quiet. As hard as that may be, I know, for some of you even harder. The will of God for you at this moment is 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstance, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Wow, okay, so much to consider here. Most importantly, remember, remember, God is after the heart. He's the heart inspector. Make sure you are operating from a pure heart, a heart of compassion, a heart surrendered to Jesus, a heart after God, a heart consumed by the Holy Spirit. Yes. There will be times when Holy Spirit will stir you up and God will speak, will, you know, will, he'll put something in, in your mind, in your heart, and he'll say, speak. And he'll put the exact words an individual needs to hear, even a stranger. But that will come straight from the Lord, okay? That's entirely different. You, you must be obedient and follow only God's leading allow God to supernaturally move through you and speak words of life. But anything outside of that will make things worse, okay? A heart outside of that can destroy. It can destroy relationships and hurt people. Then you yourself will be operating outside of God's will. My desire for you ladies is that none of you, none of you end up at a dead end. I love you. I love you ladies. See you at the table.